I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Aleko Eskandarian. I heard Aleko speak at a concussion conference a few years back, and from all the educational lectures and workshops, it was by far one of the most impactful parts of the, evening, of the meeting. So I was thrilled when I reached out to Aleko and received an immediate and enthusiastic response to be a part of this NORA event. Aleko is a former professional soccer player who currently works at Major League Soccer headquarters in New York City in the Player Relations and Com Competition Department. He grew up in New Jersey and attended Bergen Catholic High School, where he was named Gatorade National Player of the Year in 2000. He went on to attend the University of Virginia, where he played for three seasons before leaving school early to turn professional. At UVA, he was a three-time All-American and the recipient of the Herman Trophy given to the best college soccer player in the country. Aleko, uh, Aleko left school early to sign with Major League Soccer and was selected with the number one overall pick in the 2003 MLS Super Draft by DC United. He played in MLS for eight seasons with DC United, Toronto FC, Real Salt Lake, and LA Galaxy. He was twice named an MLS All-Star and was named MLS Cup MVP in 2004 as he led DC United to the championship. He was also a member of the U.S. men's national team before being forced to retire at the age of 27 due to concussions. After his playing career, he coached professionally for five years before taking a front office position with M MLS. Aleko's inspiring journey in the face of difficult times provides a strong reminder to all of us why we are here this week. I am sure you will all come out of this presentation with the same impression as I did. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Aleko Eskandarian. I'll, I'll just start off by telling you a little bit about myself and my story, and I think uh, the first place I, I need to start is, is with my family. Um, as, as Shirley mentioned, my background, it's also really important for me to talk about my parents uh, and, and the journey to the United States. My father was a professional soccer player, uh, played in the 1978 World Cup, and then shortly after signed with the New York Cosmos, and that's actually how my family moved over to the United States, and we settled in New Jersey. Um, my mom was an athlete herself. My brother uh, also played soccer at a high level all the way through college, um, but if you ask my mom, she definitely has the most uh, soccer chops in the family. Um, with that said, it was, it was really important for me to talk about how um, Soccer was such a huge part of my life growing up. It's, it's what we watched every day. Um, it's what I emulated. And for me, it was a huge part of my ambition to follow in my father's footsteps. I'm not going to go over my, my highlights. Um, Shirley did a great job explaining it all, so I'm not going to bore you with it. If anything, I think it just it shows I didn't suck. So that's <laughs> always good. Um, but most importantly for me, it's, it's just to show how um, ingrained soccer was in my life uh, from an early age all the way through you know high school college and, and to the professional ranks it meant everything to me and it was everything that I identified with so that brings us to why I'm here um, as Shirley mentioned I, I retired due to concussions um, I had four documented concussions during my professional career and I say documented because I'm not sure what the exact number was, but um, there were plenty of times where you were dizzy or got bumped in the head and were disoriented, and you know a trainer would run out and kind of give you the finger test, and you're like, ah, oh, you're okay, go ahead and play on. Um, so uh, I'm not sure exactly how many I, I truly had, but um, there were four professionally that um, really did a number on me. Um, the, the big thing for me and, and why I'm here now is there was a, a long time where for my own mental health, I kind of needed to avoid talking about concussions. Uh, after I retired, there were plenty of athletes, coaches, parents that would reach out to me looking for advice. I heard you went through this and now you have to stop playing. Who did you see? Are you feeling better? Um, at a certain point, it got a bit overwhelming. And I realized the more I talked about it, the more I tried to help people, the more it dragged me down. And I started thinking, man, I'm, I'm not doing so great. And the more I thought about my own shortcomings and my own struggles, the more difficult it became to help other people. So for a while, um, I did try to help. I did try to speak to everyone. 
And finally, there came a time where I needed to just step away, um, to stop talking about it, to um, kind of refocus my own life and to get myself better before I could help others. Finally, about three years ago, um, I was approached by the Players' Tribune. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but uh, it's basically a, a media outlet that gives a platform uh, to athletes to have a voice and uh, share their story with whatever they want to talk about. So they approached me and I had a, a decent social media following and they said, the floor is yours, what would you like to talk about? And finally there came a moment where um, I felt comfortable sharing my story with concussions. Um, when, I, when I start talking about my concussions, the first ever professional match that I played, my professional debut, is when I received my first concussion. Um, I will let Gary run, run the video, but... Um, Oh, no problem, no problem. But for context, uh, this was my professional debut with DC United in 2003 against the Chicago Fire. And I came into this game in the 60th minute, I believe. Tony Stewart against C.J. Brown. Escondarian is at the top of the box. Stewart looks for it. Paul Kanaka with a tremendous clear, taking down two D.C. attackers. Escondarian hasn't moved. Bocanegra meant business coming all the way through. Boy, where did this train come from? Bocanegra played it perfectly. No malice intended personally toward these players, but they were in the wrong place because they got in front of the freight. And train number four was on time. It looked like someone was trying to pick up a two. Pin spare right here. What Bocanegra charging into the middle of the picture right here to win this ball and the, the very hard collision and most of it actually between the two DC United players right there. But a great win of the ball on the part of Bocanegra. A little miscommunication and uh, both these players on United caught the worst of it. Now, Convy and Eskandarian were the players down and Eskandarian was in a very strange position with his arm stuck behind him and it appeared he was dazed, at least for a moment. He's back up. Convy's back on his feet. Bocanegra has not only great speed, but immense jumping ability. Uh, it's good to see both these players up, and they seem to be okay. They're both wondering what's happening. And Bernie Stewart walked over and said, I told you guys that's Zach Thornton stuff. Stay out of his way. Escadarian just got augered in. He landed head first. Escadarian starting to feel all the limbs again. He looks a little woozy. So, yeah, I apologize. It's pretty graphic. I could probably count on one time that I've, I've been able to watch it myself. Um, the first thing I'll, I'll tell you about that collision is I don't remember anything. Um, I had amnesia, like a gap of about six hours that I don't um, remember at all. Um, everything from before the game to probably an hour or two afterward, to the point that I didn't recognize my own parents after the game. I just walked right by them. Um, and then it felt like an hour or two later in the hospital, someone clapped in front of my face and all of a sudden uh, I came to. Um, but as you could see, I'm very, very lucky I didn't break my neck and end up paralyzed. Um, there were some clear symptoms right off the bat of being unconscious, um, being woozy. As you see when I'm standing up, I don't have any balance. Um, clearly looking nauseous. My eyes, I think, were even a bit off um, as well as they're evaluating me. Um, however, the most concerning thing I can tell you is that um, I was allowed to stay in that game. Um, I played, I went off to the sideline and then I, I entered back onto the field of play. Again, I don't remember any of this. I played for another 10 minutes or so. And fortunately for me, my opponent, Carlos Bocanegra, um, he, he could kind of sense that I wasn't all there. So he started to try to talk to me. He says that I just started cursing at him, which I, I told him I apologize. I like him actually, I don't know why I did that. Um, but he, he says, he asked me, do you know where you are? And apparently I told him San Francisco, but we were in DC. So he starts kind of motioning to my teammates to 
get me off the field. And for reasons that are beyond me, uh, a few minutes later, I run towards half field, sit down Indian style, and uh, a trainer and doctor come over and um, get me out of the game. So that was, uh, that was my, my professional debut. Um, and when I wrote the article, I, I said that, you know, it was my first game, one that I was supposed to never forget, but instead it's one that I will never remember. Um, from then on out, um, it was really interesting because I was totally fine. Um, once I kind of came to in the hospital, uh, I started asking questions and I'm like, why, why am I here? I was really confused. Why am I here? My parents were there in the hospital with me. I had some friends there and I could kind of hear people muttering like, oh, he's still out of it because I was, I was conscious and I was just muttering nonsense. So finally I, I flipped out like, who's going to tell me why I'm here? And they're like, we're here for you. And I'm like, for what? I feel fine. And they're like, you hit your head. How are you feeling? And the funny thing is, and I think you guys saw in that video, I'm like kind of cracking my knuckles as, I, as I'm walking off the field. The answer I gave was, oh, my, I'm fine, but my fingers hurt. And they were like, okay, we're, we're not too concerned about your fingers right now. We're going to do some tests on your head. Um, sure enough, I walked out of the hospital that night with three broken fingers. Um, and my head felt totally fine. I was back in practice the next day. So um, I finished out the rest of the season. And... Um, ultimately, I got a second concussion the very next year, um, involved in a bit of a scuffle with, with uh, my teammates and opponents. Someone got pushed into me, and uh, their head slammed to the back of my head. Again, not, I don't really remember. Um, again, I stayed in the game, and there was a moment where I remember we were playing the Dallas Burn at the time, and... I remember being on the field and all of a sudden looking up at the clock and being like, I'm in a game right now. Like, what am I doing? Like, it's the 35th minute. I feel like I don't remember anything from like the fifth minute. And oddly enough, I remember just kind of coming to, getting to my senses. And I scored two goals in the second half of that game. So uh, I, I recovered enough, I guess. But after the game, I went over to our trainers. and I'm like, hey, I got a pretty rough headache. So again, took the weekend off, a few days. Uh, I felt totally fine. However, um, my third concussion uh, really did a number on me that, that I'll get into, but we'll roll the video Here's first. Time and time again tonight. Doing a great job anticipating. And again, ideally, you want to cut out some of these skip headers at the, at the start. Meantime, Lisa's out as he collides with Escadarian. And Escadarian really paid the price as Reese came out high. Well, and what they tell you as a keeper is you're going to come for this ball, particularly the 50-50 ball. You know, Aleko, the danger that he's in is he's looking over, the shoulder, looking over his shoulder for the ball. We're going to see this here. And you can see Reese coming at the last second, and there's definitely contact. I mean, that's it looks like knee to the head. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's about as solid as you're going to get. Yeah, that's, that's really... We're going to see it even better here. You know, and, and again, and let me stress, this is nothing intentional on Reese's part. He's not putting his shoes up. He's not trying to go after Aleko or anything like that. He's just coming out trying to play the ball, make himself big. But with his defender in the way, I mean, Aleko, you could see him just sort of pull back at the last second there, but couldn't get out of the way. I, I think he, uh, wearing simple, got hit squarely in the head. You see, yeah, he gets, he gets hit in the head. Yeah, there's, there's no question. It looks like the left knee of Reese into, right into his skull. Well, that's uh, the best on that. Is, uh, Aleko was up, but... Uh, Better believe they're going to take every precaution with the uh, Lecker. You see exactly they're doing just that. But, again, what we have to be careful of a little bit is DC's used all three subs. They can't bring anybody else on. They have to play a man down if the was hurt. Here's what's happened uh, so far. And this is, again, a good dummy right in front of the goal. Santino got the top, top finish, but he does what he has to. Gets the goal, gets him on the board early. And this is all by Moreno. On a dancing, swim, beating the closer, finish. Green Star United, two and two minutes. It's been all downhill from there. Well, and Gomez on that free kick, just quality service. And I hope, uh, hope the electors are okay, but again, uh, that's, that's the knee to the head, right to the head, or shim to the head. Yeah, and he's, he's still feeling it, I think. Yeah, but outside of ultimate fighting, you don't, you don't see that kind of well, blow too And actually, uh, I would be surprised if play the rest of the 10 men because. Uh, he really got nailed. Good depth. And 
afternoon in the flick. So that was the third one. Um, and I have to say that one felt very, very different. Um, the one thing you'll notice, even with the commentary, and it kind of, you know, it, I cringe when I look back on it and I, and I hear the, the and I see the videos and I hear people talking about it. But ultimately, I'm, I'm also proud of how far we've come because you haven't heard the word concussion uttered once um, during any of those videos. And it was always dinged in the head, took a hard knock, seems disoriented, you know, hopefully you'll snap back into it. Um, that was kind of the, the feeling around head injuries. Um, so we've come a long way in that regard. Unfortunately, with, with this concussion, um, I uh, right away sensed that something was wrong. As soon as I went to take a shower um, and got evaluated by our team doctors, the first thing I said was, I, I feel like I have pressure in my skull. Um, and so they did their, their testing and their cognitive testing and um, I, I couldn't shake this. I was like, I have a five pound weight that's just sitting in my head. I can't, I can't describe it. Um, our doctors told me, make sure you don't drive home on your own, have one of your friends drive you home. Next morning I woke up and it just felt like a cinder block was, was, uh, was weighing my head down. Um, I went and got further evaluations, testing, went and saw a neurologist and again, went through all the testing until they, about a week later, they said, you're cleared to play. And it kind of reminds me of Shirley's stories a little bit where I was like, I don't feel okay. Um, I still have a headache. I still am getting some migraines. Um, I still have this pressure that's, that's just sitting there. I don't know what it is, but I don't feel okay. However, um, as a pro athlete, when your neurologist and your trainer tell you that you're cleared to play, it's almost like, okay, well, they are looking out for my best interest. And if they tell me I'm okay, then I'm okay. So I went back into practicing, um, again, still having these symptoms and, and having uh, to deal with, with uh, this pressure. And I started noticing that after practicing, I would get these, these sharp headaches. So I told our trainer and he said, look, I'll set you up to go see the neurologist again. And when I went to see the neurologist again, you know, I explained to him everything that I was going through and he ran me through another series of tests. Um, and he came back and he said, you're fine. You're good to go, passed everything. And I'm like, I don't feel fine. I, I still have these headaches. I still have this pressure. And he's like, well, when do they come about? And I was like, oh, usually when, um, when I'm practicing uh, or after practice, after I exert myself. And he's like, well, try to take Tylenol or, or painkillers before practice then and preemptively treat uh, the headaches that you're getting. And I remember seeing that office. I'm like, this doesn't sound right. Um, and I told him to his face, I'm like, this doesn't sound right. And I'll never forget his words. He, he looked at me and he said, he said, you know, most people come in here and they try to convince me that they're okay. And I tell them that they're not, I'm telling you, you're totally fine. And you're telling me that you're not okay. And I'm like, I don't feel okay. And he looked at me and he said, who's the doctor? And it really, really uh, left a, a bad taste in my mouth, but I walked out of the office saying, yeah, you're right, I, I'm not a doctor. Um, I know my body, but um, at this point, I have no choice but to take his advice. So I went back to training again. I started taking pain medication, started taking Tylenol before practices, after practices. Um, we're still getting those symptoms and I, and I wasn't feeling right, but I was back in training. And uh, I had a, a life-altering moment in that the day before a match, and I was supposed to start in, in a match the next day, um, I had taken my Tylenol like, like I was doing every day. And as I'm driving home, uh, for any of, anyone that's from DC, I was on 395 heading to Georgetown to my apartment. And all of a sudden, I just got a really, really sharp headache, almost like uh, someone screeching their fingernails uh, on a chalkboard. And it made me lose control of my car. And I ended up veering like three lanes um, through speeding traffic. Through the grace of God, uh, no one was hurt. Um, I ended up uh, quickly pulling over, called my trainer, and I said, I need to go see a different doctor. I'm not OK. I'm not satisfied with what I heard from the last neurologist. He set up an appointment right then and there. That afternoon, I went to go see um, a doctor who, or a neurologist for the Washington Capitals, the hockey team. 
I went there, walked into his office, told him my entire story of, you know, where it all started to where I was until that day. And his advice was, well, we're shutting you down for two months. I told him that's great, but I have a game tomorrow and I'm starting. So can we like start this the next day? And he looked at me and he said, in all, in all seriousness, he's like, if you play in that match tomorrow with all the symptoms that you're currently feeling, and if you get hit the wrong way, you could die on the field. And when he said that, it really made me take a step back um, and kind of reevaluate everything. And in some ways, I was relieved because I knew I wasn't feeling okay, but I was convincing myself that I was okay, especially with the, the previous uh, neurologist's advice. And finally, when he said that, I was like, okay, this guy is onto something. So um, I got shut down for, for two months, which then turned into 10 months. Um, and it was a struggle every single day, not knowing when I was gonna come back, not knowing what, how much I could exert myself. Um, not having a timetable uh, in itself was, was one of the most difficult things for any athlete to go through. If you hurt your ankle or tear your ACL, have surgery, you always have a timetable of return. And this was something where we just worked in two month increments and it drove me crazy. Um, I would spend full days just in my apartment, wouldn't even eat a meal. Not that I was like trying to be uh, dramatic or anything. I would literally just not be hungry. Um, my mind was just so preoccupied with, with uh, what the future would hold. And it had a huge effect. Um, I was told I couldn't run. So being the smart ass that I was, I went to training every day. And I asked our, our kit man to give me every piece of like winter clothing that we had. I looked like the Michelin man with how like bulked up I was uh, with extra layers of clothes. And I would just walk around the field in like July, 100 degree weather. And my teammates, my coaches like, what are you doing? I'm like, I can't run. I want to stay fit. I don't want to just, you know, sit and be a vegetable. So this is what I'll do to stay fit. So finally, um, my coach, thankfully at the time was like, okay, this isn't good for you mentally to be around the team right now when you're not doing well, um, which was a huge step because in the beginning, all my teammates and even coaches were like, come on, like get back. We need you. They're trying to encourage me to, to get back on the field. Um, and it, you know, and that's what teammates do. You know, every time someone's hurt, you want to almost rib them a little bit to encourage them to get back. Um, little things like, Oh, you have a headache and that's why you're not playing. Like, some of the married guys are like, I have a wife and two kids. I have a headache every day. I still play. Um, but after a few weeks, which then turned into a few months, um, everyone started to realize how serious it was and how much it was affecting my life. So I actually went home to New Jersey to be with my family and just get away from soccer, get away from the team for a bit. And I started to get better. But even then, my, my relationship started being strained with my friends, with my family. I didn't want to talk about what I was feeling and no one could understand what I was feeling. Um, after a certain while, you know, my mom, uh, God bless her every day. She's like, how are you feeling today? How are you feeling today? And I'm like, mom, I feel the same every day. I don't want to answer your question anymore. Please stop asking. Um, but in some ways I had to really go through to isolation to, to get better. Um, and I did get better. So after 10 months, uh, I was fortunate enough to return to the field. Um, I came back the next season, I played, I even made the all-star team, um, and many were relieved about you know, me being back, but uh, I was never, never quite the same. I couldn't put my finger on it, but um, I, I never felt the same that I did prior to that. And in the ensuing few years, I, I bounced around, I got traded a few times. I went from DC United to Toronto FC to Real Salt Lake, uh, then to LA where I finished my career with the LA Galaxy. And finally, um, in 2009, I had my last concussion um, with, while playing with the LA Galaxy in a friendly match against AC Milan. A cross came in, went just over my head, defender on the, on the backside went to clear it, uh, smashed the ball right into my face. It was one of those where I was in midair as, as the ball and turning my head around as the clearance hit my, my face. It broke my nose, but my neck muscles totally relaxed, my head totally exposed. Um, and again, I went down and right away I knew this isn't good. I talked to my trainers, spoke to the doctor. 
and they were all very helpful and took every precaution, took me out of the game. And then I watched the collision uh, uh, on on video later, and I was like, man, I took that first hit again in DC, the third one. This one's nothing. It's just the ball hitting my face. This happens to every soccer player at one point or another. And I'm like, it can't be that bad. I'm going to return from this one. So I convinced my coach at the time, uh, Bruce Arena, um, not to put me on the season ending injury list. And I was determined to, to come back. So I started little by little following those same steps that my neurologist in DC had prescribed a few years back. Um, and I felt like I was on the right track until all of a sudden I got hit with uh, a new symptom, which was vertigo. And I'd never experienced anything like that in my life before. Um, but it really, really changed uh, my entire outlook on my injury and the rest of my career. Um, I had uh, a few moments where um, I had to go to the hospital. I passed out at like a family dinner just from too many conversations going on. It became, uh, it became very serious just like that overnight. And at the end of the season, team doctors pulled me aside and they're like, listen, we care about you and your future. And unfortunately, you, we can't clear you to play professional soccer ever again. So uh, from there, uh, I started to focus on my recovery and it became really difficult. Again, uh, I refer to it as the invisible injury because no one could ever really see what I was going through. And all you get are questions. How do you feel? What about this? Does it bother you when you do this? Does the sunlight hurt? Does the noise bother you? Um, and then you start overanalyzing everything like, all right, I'm feeling kind of off right now. Is it because of the sun or is it because I had two beers last night? Like, what, what is it? And everything starts uh, compiling and, and you start um, truly being a self-critic and, and, and self-diagnosing yourself, which if you don't have all the right information is, is uh, quite difficult to, uh, as well. And um, the, the biggest thing was it started to change my personality. I was always a, a very positive guy, always uh, a locker room clown, um, but suddenly, it, it was tough to get by every day. I lived um, right on the beach in, in Hermosa Beach, and uh, I lived in paradise. You know, there was never a bad day walking uh, out on the beach and uh, with all my friends and, and being able to play the sport that I love as my job. Suddenly that got taken away from me uh, overnight, and uh, depression began to sink in. Um, with these new symptoms, uh, I was always searching for answers, and I didn't know what necessarily brought them on. Everything from vertigo, sleep deprivation, I was probably sleeping three, four hours a night at that point. Couldn't fall asleep, and then would wake up uh, at the butt crack of dawn and, and not be able to go back to sleep again. Sensitivity to, to light and sound, motion sickness, um, that was an, another new symptom of sitting in the backseat of a car suddenly made me want to throw up. Um, I had TMJ, I had a bit of a, a lazy eye, which I, I know I, I talked to Shirley about, but something as simple as driving my car and looking to the rear view mirror and back, I started noticing, I was like, something must be in my eye. I don't know what it is, but I kept picking at my eye. And finally, after you know the 50th time that it happened, I'm like, okay, it's actually my eye. It's not that there's uh, an eyelash in there. Um, so I went and got all sorts of testing done. Um, visited all these different great facilities who took great care of me, but ultimately um, was able to detect some deficiencies, but never able to really solve the problem. So um, after that, I decided I needed to get away from California, from the team, from soccer in general. Uh, I decided to go back to school to UVA, University of Virginia, to finish my degree. Um, when I went back there, uh, I faced a new set of challenges just with trying to focus in class, trying to uh, spend a lot of time on the computer without getting symptoms. Uh, it got awfully frustrating, um, but in some ways it was, it was really necessary for me to just get away from it all. At a certain point, I was thinking, maybe I've recovered. It's been a little while now. Um, let me maybe try to start kicking the ball around and, and see if I feel better. And that ended horribly, as you could imagine, where just a simple kick around with, with a couple of uh, my old buddies turned into my friend uh, having, to, having to drive me 
to the hospital um, because I got vertigo and then got like the shakes and my body was just all out of whack. Um, and I remember kind of leaning over to him in the car and I'm like, it's over for real this time. And he's like, just don't die in my car. Like, I just want to get you to the hospital in time. I don't know what's going on with you. Um, but that was an important moment because, uh, and my father always said this, for every pro athlete, um, you almost live two lives. Once, you're, once your life as a pro athlete is done, you have to close the book of that chapter, or close the chapter of that book and, and move on uh, to the next phase. So uh, at that point, I started to just focus on my recovery and just to live a, a normal life. And for me, this was um, really, really difficult. Um, I think I, I wrote it in the last slide, but it was, it was very much a catch-22 because all I, all I yearned for was for, to feel normal again. And, and feeling normal, it could be good, could be bad, whatever it is, but there's just a feeling when you wake up that you're like, I'm, I'm normal, I'm okay. And I had lost that. And all I wanted was to feel normal. And then on the flip side, I was really, really frustrated, almost demoralized when people treated me like I felt normal because I didn't feel normal. So it was like this weird you know, a uh, situation where all I wanted to do was feel normal, but then I didn't want to be treated normal because I, I didn't feel that way. And it became really, really tough to communicate. And again, it just uh, brought on some sort of, of depression that I, that I held inside. But um, eventually I, I was lucky to reach out to a PT that I was working with uh, at the LA Galaxy. And she actually reached out to me and said, hey, I uh, have been spending some time with Dr. Collins uh, from University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and he's talking about this new active rehabilitation um, that he's suggesting his patients should do, where it's not good to just you know rest on your laurels and and not be active. So she kind of gave me um, some new exercises and, and therapy to try out, and from that moment on, I, I became my own doctor in many ways. Um, I started to try to, to exert myself, try to do some exercises, try to run. And it was a really, really tough process. Um, I, I literally started from scratch. Everything from even a walk around the block was difficult. Um, anything that got my heart rate up became difficult, would bring on symptoms. And um, I mentioned in the slide here, but uh, at a certain point I was like, okay, I gotta try to run again. And I'll never forget, I, I went on the treadmill and I think I was at like speed 5.0, like literally the bare minimum jog that you can do. And mind you, I was used to, as a pro athlete, doing like 12.5, 13.0 on a treadmill. And so 5.0, I start running, and next thing I know, I just start feeling like thump, 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 thump. And I'm like, all right, it's just, just my feet hitting the treadmill. And then it's like building more and more and more in my head. And I think I made it not even a quarter of a mile. I stepped off the treadmill, so I wasn't running anymore, and I could still feel thump, 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 thump in my head. And I burst into tears. Like I, I remember I was alone in my uh, parents' basement on the treadmill, and I just started crying because I'm like, this is awful. Like If this is my life now, like I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Um, and you know, it was one of the saddest days uh, of my life, if I'm being quite honest. But next morning, I woke up, I didn't have a headache, and I said, let's try this again. And I literally built up from there just every day, trying to do a little bit, a little bit, increase it when I could, and, and make sure I wasn't getting uh, more symptoms. Um, and the reason I love telling that story is because uh, two years ago, I ended up running the New York City Marathon. So it all worked out in, in the end. You could clap for that because I'll never do it again. <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, you know, the, the main message, I guess, that I would send uh, with that is it's, it's not anything that happens overnight. It was really, really frustrating. I'm, I'm really, really lucky that I had a strong support group um, that allowed me to get through it. I have a, a great family, some wonderful friends, um, some great medical professionals that um, had the patience and, and belief to work with me. And that's honestly the only thing that, that helped me get through because um, having to deal with the frustration of not being able to do what you think you can do every single day and having those questions lingering in your mind um, is truly debilitating. 
So um, what do I do now? Um, as Shirley mentioned, I, I uh, began focusing my passion towards um, other avenues where I could still stay involved in the game. Uh, I coached professionally for five years until making the transition to Major League Soccer's front office. I'm in the player relations uh, and competition department where I get to work on everything from salary caps to budgets to player signings and transfers to youth development um, to scouting. So I, I'm very much ingrained in the game. And, and one of the great things is that our medical department was very welcoming of me to include me on their concussion committee um, and help share my perspective and my opinion and, and my experiences um, that have helped shape some of the new initiatives that we've rolled out just in the last few years. Um, I think for me, it was so important to never see anyone go through what, what I went through. Um, just seeing the video again uh, tonight, it truly uh, gives me goosebumps in the, in the wrong way of, of, of uh, you know, makes me really sad and, and upset. So every time I see any other player that goes down with an injury, um, I, I right away uh, get some red in my eyes because I want to make sure they're being treated the, the right way. And um, for me, that's why it's so important to be here tonight and share my story. Um, at the end of the day, we're all part of this when it comes to player safety. And I think the biggest message that I want to send to, to you guys tonight is thank you because all of you that are in this room are such a key part uh, of the process of keeping players safe, keeping athletes safe, um, and just humans in general that, that suffer. For, for a long time, um, you know, as, a, as an athlete having that mentality, it was always about do it on your own, get through it on your own. But this injury has truly, truly humbled me to know that you can't do it alone and you need all the help you can get. So with that, I just want to thank all of you in this room again for all you do. The work that you do will save lives, will change lives, um, and I'm truly, truly grateful. Thank you.